Good luck. Great. We want to welcome everyone as you're joining us. And if you want to take a minute and just share in chat where you're dialing in from, we'd love to see where you're joining us from today. We're going to go ahead and get started in a couple minutes. We're just going to give some more time for those who are joining us. It's just it's just the top of the hour now, so we'll give it a bit more. Welcome, Kentucky. Hi, Cancer Ashley. Center. Hello. Hey, Rebecca. I was just in Columbia a few weeks ago with Patrick. Good to see you. Uh, hey, VCU. I'm due to come see you soon. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Rebecca. Nice to meet you, too. I see we have UC Davis. A little earlier. It's still morning there, so when we say good afternoon, don't feel left out. Yeah. I see they're still trickling in, so we'll give it maybe one more minute. Welcome, Gonzaga. Great to have you with us. Another West Coast uh, uh, attendee. Ooh, University of Kansas. Good morning. Good afternoon. All of the things. <laughs> and Minnesota, too. University of Minnesota. Great to have you with us. Hi, Lauren, University of Texas at Austin. We're getting great participation from all around the country. It's great to have all of you here. I know we'll have a few more join, but we actually have a really full agenda for today. So Elizabeth, why don't we go ahead and get started? That sounds great. So we'll start with just our basic introductions. I am Kara Wagner. I'm an Associate Vice President for BWF, and I have been a longtime frontline fundraiser. So as I tell all of our clients, I know what it is like to walk in your shoes. I have walked the walk for many, many years. And as a consultant, my sole focus is on healthcare. So while my partners, all across BWF um, are uh, in the academic space, nonprofits. We really run the gamut and we are a full service consulting firm. For both Elizabeth and myself, we are fully focused on healthcare. That way we can really be specialist in um, a unique sector of philanthropy. That's right. Hello everyone, I'm Elizabeth Dalhoff brown I'm a consulting partner with BWF and have been with the firm for about a year now. Um, a consulting partner is someone who um, also has a day job and I'm pleased to share that I'm the Associate Vice President for Development at the Geisel School of Medicine at Dartmouth College and Dartmouth Health, which is the um, healthcare system that's associated, but uh, they're not one organization, it's actually two organizations, which is why I'm really excited to have a chance to talk about this topic today because um, I've been in healthcare fundraising for over a decade and in development for almost 25 years. And um, 
the power of academic medical centers is pretty exciting when it comes to philanthropy. Well, let's dig in. And I'm going to start with just a few ground rules, actually. Um, and those ground rules include, please do ask questions. And please put your questions in the chat. Um, and we'll also have time for some Q&A um, as we go through. But we're going to start with just defining an academic medical center. And that's really basic. But honestly, the whole point of today's webinar is making sure that we don't miss the basics. All of you who work in academic medicine, you live it and breathe it every single day. We often don't see what is right in front of us and the unique nature of what is right in front of us. And it's really important that we start with the basic definition so that we have that baseline and can build upon it. And really today is about how do you message these points with donors? How do you infuse that into your everyday communications? And before we can get into how we apply, we must understand what an academic medical center is. And Elizabeth and I are not gonna read every word on the slide, um, but really an academic medical center really comes down to teaching, it is a teaching hospital. It delivers the best in care. And we also have the research component. There are really three legs of the stool. And it's important that we realize that and communicate each leg of those stools. Additionally, it's important for us to remember that while it is providing patient care, it is a crucial role in developing and training the next generation of medical professionals and conducting that research that leads to the new treatments. But here's the key. We can't make assumptions that our audience also knows those three basic components because they're not really all that basic. And again, given the unique nature, it's really important that we make no assumptions and even our own colleagues, especially as we have new higher orientation. Remember to take a step back and help your new colleagues and existing realize exactly what an AMC is so that they can infuse it into their daily communications. So now it's our opportunity to hear from you. We'd like to ask you to participate in a poll that we're going to launch in just a moment that really tells us a little bit about the frequency that you use being in an academic medical center in your fundraising and your communications. So you can see the polls open, and we ask that you just take a minute and tell us a little bit about how you use it. All right, we have about 30% in. And I love that we have a few folks who are saying, am I even at an academic medical center? <laughs> Thank you for your honesty. That's right. That's right. <laughs> All right, we have quite a few who are saying it is at the forefront of communications. And then also quite a few who say with select audiences. And later we're going to get into, so be thinking about your examples of how you use them, because we will be asking that. Elizabeth and I mm -hmm. um, really want to hear from all of you. So be thinking of those examples and know that we'll be asking for them later. All right, we have about 75% in those last few of you. I think it's really interesting about half of you use it at the forefront of your communications and the the rest of the half of you, it's split between the other three categories. That's great. All right. I think we I think we have in most of the answers that we're going to get. So again, we've got about 52% of you that say it is at the forefront. And what I'm going to be interested to know is when you use it at the forefront, do you actually use the terminology of academic medical center? Because what we find is often it is at the forefront of your communications, but you may not use the actual terminology, which we really encourage all of you to do. And you'll see throughout this webinar how important that really is. But now that we are, we're going to close the poll. And right now we are going to show you some good examples. Okay, we know who has used 
We, we know about half of you use them. But again, how do you use them? And we're gonna show you a really great example of from Penn Medicine. And Penn Medicine does a great job by highlighting it directly on their website. As soon as you get to their website, they say, hey, here's why this is important. And they've done a really nicely produced video. And we're gonna share that right now. Hospitals, they all do. Maybe basically the same thing, right? Well, you may be surprised to know that there's a huge difference between regular hospitals and academic medical centers like Penn. Here's why. Most hospitals are focused primarily on treating the patients that come through the door, which is very important. But an academic medical center does that and so much more. It's where education, research, and clinical care all come together in one place. At a top-ranked academic medical center like Penn, you can rest assured that the doctors taking care of you aren't just using the latest medical technologies, they're also developing them. With physicians, nurses, researchers, and teachers all working in unison, patients have better access to the latest medical breakthroughs and clinical trials that aren't available at other hospitals. And the doctors who treat you are often the top experts in their field. The ones teaching future generations of physicians the best way to care for their patients. Here at Penn, we've integrated every aspect of patient care, from the classroom to the lab to the operating room. So whether you're dealing with seasonal allergies, cancer, or anything in between, you know that you're getting the highest level of medical care. For more information about how an academic medical center can help you, visit PennMedicine.org. A great example, Kara. Thanks, Elizabeth. All right, so we've seen a really strong example, and again, we'll kind of refer back to that because if you if you look at the video again, you're going to see that it really does incorporate in a very easily consumable way the power of an AMC. So really, what what is it? The so what, right? So we know that that is where medical research really happens. And yes, Big Pharma also is conducting research and is an important partner to us at academic medical centers. But when you're speaking with donors, it's also really important to remember Big Pharma needs us as well. And that AMC is a critical part of new drug development and really has saved millions of lives because of the, the medical breakthroughs that happen every single day. We know that it's shaping the future of medicine. There are a more diverse medical team than ever before, and that delivers the very best of medicine. And we know we're going to see that for years to come. And of course, at the heart of it all is advancing patient care. And it's really a, a startling number that 20% higher odds of survival are seen at teaching hospitals versus non teaching. If you think about the loved ones that are included in that 20%, it's a really powerful number. That's right. And when we take a look at the role of philanthropy at AMCs, you know, in the first, uh, you know, number portion of this presentation today, we're going to be talking a lot about the benefits of AMCs, what they do for health and community and, and for uh, research. We're also going to talk about some of the challenges. And at the end, I want you to keep this slide in mind because we're circling back to this. The role of philanthropy at AMCs and how we approach this as, as fundraisers and communicators, um, really it goes back to how can people make a difference? How can they see a better future through giving to an AMC? And just like Kara was talking about, it's important that um, these are places where research happens, where innovation happens, where patient care can really be delivered in a way, uh, in best in, best in class and quality. Um, I think that many AMCs are playing an important and, and maybe even new role in addressing health disparities and making sure that um, really everyone has access to care. And also, again, it's producing that next generation of medical professionals. And philanthropy certainly supports the scholarships and fellowships and, and other sorts of educational expanding opportunities that we have um, through our AMCs. Thanks, Elizabeth. 
as we as we continue to remind you that these are all things you really do know. And again, you live and breathe every day. It's how do we communicate them to our donors? And obviously, by talking about the benefits and opportunities, that's where one starts, right? And as I had just said, 20% higher rate of survival. But it's also really important to remember that both the 20% higher rate of survival and a lower 30-day mortality rate from a recent study, it reflects that this is not just for our most sick patients. And why I underscore this is we'll talk later about maybe some of those fears or misconceptions around AMCs. And one of them is, well, I'm not that sick. I don't need that type of hospital. And both of these numbers are for both the illest patients as well as those that are not the most sick. And what that means is when something becomes critical or even diagnostics, the diagnostic tools can oftentimes be better. What it means is that even though you may not think that you need the resources provided, being able to have them at the doctor's fingertips means lower mortality rates for those who may not be the sickest of the sick, but need them when they need them. This is really those three legs that we've talked about when it comes to research. And again, we know these, we know that basic research leads to translational research, which leads to clinical trials, which oftentimes leads to saving lives. But when we're communicating these out, again, back to the defining, it's really important that when you're working with donors, that you don't just make the assumption that they understand. Translational research is a really good example that they often think they know what you're referring to, but do they? And so this is, any, this is something that we all just need to keep in mind for the basic nature of it. And basic. Let's start with basic science, which is anything but, right? And as Elizabeth and I were, were going through this, I said, well, you know, the mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell, right? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> because we all remember that from our basic biology classes. I don't know how to do my taxes, but I remember that, you know, those are the important things they teach you in school, right? But really, while I joke, Knowing basic science down to the microbiology and really where it starts with cell cultures and those really physiological experiments, that leads us to understand how the body works both in illness and in health. And understanding the basics, it really gives us that building block and the hypotheses that lead us to these wonderful opportunities for treatment later which of course leads us to the translational research. This is where we see those preclinical research projects happening, the clinical research, clinical implement implementation, and public health. But this is a really interesting one too for our donors. One, you get to really talk to them about the fundamental practices and principles of science, but we really need funding for all of these components and understanding the importance of philanthropy when grants may not be there or they need that seed funding or bridge funding. When you're talking about an AMC and the unique opportunities that lie, that's where philanthropy can come in. And we have to inspire our donors by walking it back and talking about it from the basic level. Of course, all donors know about clinical trials. This is where they automatically jump to. So it's really important that they understand what comes before clinical trials. But this is really at the heart and what makes us on the main stage because patients know if I need something that is not the standard of care, there is only one place I can receive it and it is at an academic medical center. And building on that, you know, Kara talked through 
the three sort of areas or, or types of research that happen at AMCs. But a, a kind of an outgrowth of a lot of that research is drug discovery. And I think this is a great example. Um, just one example for those of you, especially at a cancer center, 80% um, of drugs developed from my, multiple myeloma from 2001 to 2019 had an academic innovator or inventor. Um, and, and you can really see here um, on this chart, just the amazing contributions that academic Medical Center has just in cancer research, um, but you, you multiply that across all the disciplines and it's an incredible in effect of uh, the, the power that research has to deliver patient care and, and better outcomes for patients all over the world. Talking about another leg of that three-legged stool that Cara talked about earlier, um, really AMCs are where education happens and, and really one of the challenges that I know we're all facing in this country is a lack of physicians. We just don't have enough of them. And one of the things that AMCs are doing to address this is actually um, increasing the size of their, their classes for medical school. And also 26 new medical schools have opened up in the last decade. So the the industry is responding to the need for more um, uh, more uh, people going into the field and you know really trying to make sure that there's enough um, people to take care of everyone in the future. Thinking about another benefit of AMCs, you know we really take a look at how do they help the community and, and overall health of the community? And you can see some of the statistics, statistics here. Um, I know many hospitals these days see their mission as, as not just um, supporting, um, you know, through good patient care and research and everything, but they're also providing food, shell, uh, food banks. They're looking at housing. They're looking at child care. They're looking at um, those social determinants of health that really affect the health and well-being of a community. And often those AMCs are in the best position to um, help make a community a better place by addressing those disparities and making sure that everyone has access to the care that they need. That continues on the next slide as well. Um, you know, it's talking about the health disparities and you take a look at the power that academic medical centers have to do the research and the education because that's part of their mission. And then I would add, certainly working with the community as a partner in finding solutions around health disparities, and also even working sometimes at a local, state, or national level around health policy and advocating for policies and, and um, laws that make sure that there is equal access to health care across our um, everyone in a community. And lastly, one of the benefits that I wanted to talk about are the economic benefits. Um, for many of you, if you work at, at an academic medical center, it could be one of the largest employers in your area, if not the largest. Um, this has a powerful effect on the community. And for um, donors or audience members that you work with who care about the health and vitality of their community, this is something that provides career ladders. Um, you know, someone starts maybe as a medical assistant and they work up the line and, and, and really have an opportunity to grow their career. Not only are there jobs at the academic medical center, but think of all the other businesses that supply that academic medical center, that, um, you know, vendors that provide services. These are things that um, often uh, an academic medical center is, um, uh, you know, a powerful force for the economy of a local community. And uh, one of the one of the uh, resources that we're going to share at the end is actually a short podcast that talks about this um, from Double AMC. So there's some good resources to help you think about this, especially have donors or audience members in your world who care about these things. Elizabeth, before I advance to the next slide, I would love to hear from our audience. You can just put it in the chat, and we may talk about it later, but. We've just went through what we believe are the greatest benefits and opportunities, but I'm sure we've missed one or two. Would love to hear from the group if there are any that you may either use with donors or have just seen mm -hmm. firsthand um, that we may not have touched upon because there's such a wealth of knowledge right between our walls, right? And we see it every day. I would love to hear if we've missed any of those benefits and opportunities. It would be great to hear from any of you. That said, 
we know that there are challenges as well. And often what I'm going to say, they are misconceptions and or fears. And you see, I've got my cute little friend up here because I know 100% of us on this call have heard, I don't want to be a guinea pig. Why would I take part in a clinical trial? We understand, and I bet we really do take for granted the power that clinical trials offer directly to the patient and the patient's family, but we have to understand that we live it every day and patients until they're there and scared, this is something that is more of a foreign concept to them. Mm -hmm. So we do really have to address it head on. And what I usually recommend is you really start with your patient or your physician partner's your physician team, your care team, they are there to deliver the very best care and will always start with the standard treatment. Whatever that protocol is, we can guarantee nobody starts a clinical trial without doing those. And I think when people start understanding how far down the line a clinical trial often comes, it really starts to make sense to them. But importantly, we're not the physicians, we're not the care team. This isn't the place for development. And sometimes knowing when to communicate and when to bring in physician partners for those questions is also a really hard part of our job, but it's really key. We never wanna overstep. And again, I know you can uh, read these through, but I wanna to touch upon the last one, which is, should we even talk about it? And what I mean here, this is more of an internal, thing that we often hear because again, we know what an AMC is. Do we have to call it an AMC? We're already talking about research. We're talking about patient care. That's just terminology. That's just jargon. That's industry jargon. It's more than that. Elizabeth shared just a moment ago, teaching hospitals are only 5% of hospitals in our nation, 5%. And I know that each of us, we work with our peers. I'm sure a few of you know one another on this call. Because we are exposed to it so frequently as professionals, we often forget just how rare this air is. And being able to inspire donors, but also our internal partners for saying, this is important and we do need to use industry jargon because we're special and we need to put a spotlight on that. Okay, additional challenges. And this is again where we start getting into an area that we probably don't talk a lot about as development professionals. And sometimes it's okay to say, you know what? I actually wanna follow up. I wanna, I wanna learn more about that. It's okay to say you don't know. But cost and reimbursement at an academic medical center is a very real concern because we even have payers. So our insurance companies will often nudge their patients or their, their clients to go to some community hospitals, go to some private hospitals because the reimbursements are higher. And you know we know that AMCs receive quite a bit of Medicare and Medicaid reimbursements. That is reduced government funding for research as well, that the cost is a very real factor and we need to hit it head on but we also, again, pull back if you don't know the answers. We never want to give incorrect information, but really talking about it with donors because it makes philanthropy even that much more important. And it really does help with the hospital's margins, which eventually go back into patient care and research, which is vital. Okay, guys, this is my example of a well-educated development officer. She looks so smug. She's just heard from Elizabeth and myself. She knows all about an AMC. Do you see the smugness? But now we really, <laughs> we've talked about the what, the so what. We want to get into the now what. And that's really the application of all of this. And it's being able to understand what an AMC is, the impact that it has, the benefits and opportunities, and unfortunately, the challenges. So we've reviewed all of that. But now it's time to talk about how it is applied and how you really do use it in your everyday work. Mm -hmm. So let's hear from you. I told you all to um, please think about some examples and would really like to hear of some of those examples. We want to hear how you have used it, whether it's like pen with a video, um, whether it's in your proposals, your solicitations, 
Um, sometimes we even see it in signatures, uh, signature blocks. Um, please, we want to hear from you. We're also curious if you have any examples of maybe where talking about being an, an AMC really resonated with a donor. You know, did, did it capture the imagination of anyone or did you have the opposite experience? You know, did you ever start to talk about the power of being an academic medical center and someone said, hold it, I don't know, what do you mean? What's going on? So um, we'd love to hear some from, from some of you about your examples and, and how you've used this, especially the 50% of you that do talk about, about uh, uh, integrating that into your messaging. We'd love to hear some examples. I know you guys don't want to hear just from Elizabeth and myself. We're talking a lot at you, and it's really important to, to hear from all of you as well. So I will give an example just from my, um, my clients, actually. Um, and I know we have VCU on the line, as a matter of fact. And VCU does a really great job of being an academic medical center and really um, applying it, especially to the community. And I know that we have some of our Massey Cancer Hospital from VCU Health. Um, and Massey, their cancer center director is extremely cognizant of diversity and inclusion, especially as it comes to the community, meaning let's talk to the community before they need us as a hospital and that proactive engagement. And so they very frequently utilize all three legs of this stool when speaking with the community. But I will tell you that they don't often say, because we are an academic medical center, it's not always called out. And that is with all, all, or all hospitals. Um, we know that we talk about it. We may not label it as such. And as we continue to infuse these things into our communications and our website, again, we really do want to underscore the importance of call it out, be loud and proud. And when somebody says, what's it mean to be an academic medical center? Does that mean you're part of a college? It means so much more than that. And that's often where they stop. They think it's just, oh, we'll use Massey as an example. Oh, that's part of Virginia Commonwealth University, right? Yes, and, and that opens up that conversation. That's great. Well, I think I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the applications now, and then feel free if if you one of you want to sort of share an example or or uh, jump in and and give some examples of your own. We'd love to hear that. And as Kara said, we're going to talk through some of the application to being an AMC and where do you use that. And we're going to talk about five key factors: the message that you use. Um, donor populations and motivations and how that's different at an AMC than in other kinds of healthcare organizations, how you might use it in broad communications and as a cultivation tool, and lastly, how you might use it in a solicitation. So let's start off with communication strategies and tactics. You know, first things first, within your organization, try to make sure you're all on the same page about how you're going to talk about it. This is where your colleagues that work in marketing and communications, maybe um, maybe if you have a unified um, uh, AMC where it's all one organization, there's one singular one. I know where I am, I have to consult with two different marketing communications teams, but they may already have language that they've developed around this. They might be able to partner with you if it doesn't exist to create something new. Um, also, make sure that you're talking with your leaders, um, you know, the leaders of your organizations and what are, what are the phrases they use? How do they talk about it? Um, and lastly, I think that we don't want to leave out key clinicians and researchers. These are the people who are most authentically close to the important work at AMCs. And so make sure that not only can you tap into them for telling some stories that um, really can make a difference when you're working with donors and, and others, but really they have an ability, a unique ability to share their professional passion. And so think about how you're partnering with them and educating with them in their unique role in healthcare philanthropy. <clears throat> I mentioned earlier 
AMCs have a unique opportunity to tap into a variety of different donor populations. In fact, some that other kinds of healthcare organizations don't necessarily have. Of course, it's very typical in healthcare. We have patients and families, often called the Grateful Patient Program, that we can talk with. Um, and often community members are, are very grateful for that opportunity. But there's also former learners, people who trained at your institution, maybe as residents or fellows or other kinds of learners. And there's also a unique opportunity if you were doing cutting edge research, or if you were doing things that no one else is doing, and you have the opportunity to take that message to um, research focus funders, maybe across the globe, who fund that particular kind of research that your teams are doing. Um, this really opens up your prospect pool in a way that is really unique and unusual. And that if, if you're able to leverage it right, um, you can see a lot of opportunity with. Elizabeth just reviewed the audiences. And sometimes we, are quick to pick up on maybe what a donor might be asking and how we can match their interests to a funding priority. But these three buckets, you'll you'll typically hear very similar questions per bucket. So is anyone working on a cure? And we know we've heard that many times and especially as it relates to cancer, uh, we always say there's never going to be one cure. And when you start talking about the science behind that, you can really pique some interest and then they really can get into fundable opportunities just from asking what I bet they thought was even a rhetorical question. Um, and so listening for these cues is really important. And how can I support the next generation? That's a pretty, we hope they ask that question. That's a nice, easy softball to us, right? But you can even be listening for things of, just their experience with your medical school and with your school of medicine as they talk about a professor that they loved or how hard it was to work two jobs while going to school. As you start listening about their experience, you can pivot. So again, it's the way that they ask the question and it's your job as the development professional to be able to tie it back and say, and here is what's unique about fill in the blank medical school. It's at an academic medical center. Let me tell you more about that. Um, and then I want to help people going through what I did, what I went through. And we know that we hear that. And oftentimes they may not really know what that means. They may not know if that that could even be led back to a research. That's one of those questions where the more you're able to listen and hear the cues, you can determine, hey, they actually want to get at the cause of their disease. They want to learn more about research or no, it's really the nurses that made all the difference to them when they were going through their treatment. I need to connect them to patient care and possibly nursing. Again, asking those questions and tying it back to these three legs of the stool, it's a really good way to open the door, at least nudge it open for that philanthropic discussion. Okay, Elizabeth mentioned broad communication efforts. And, you know, that's a broad term, right? It's how do we infuse this in such a way that we're really kind of putting it in a spotlight, but giving examples as well. And it's, it's even direct mail pieces. So this is a great example that this is in a direct mail piece. And it says, you can help us advance. And I know you can read this. But if you think about everything that's in here, this is a case where they are drawing attention to the unique nature and saying, you can help us advance these things. And we know with direct mail, you've got a very short time span. If they've even opened the envelope, if they've even opened the email, you have to get them right away. And being able to say, you can help with this it's just an easy way for that broad terminology and that direct marketing to be able to infuse that messaging. 
That's great. You know, Kara, we had a question pop up in the chat and um, I thought I would just throw it to you. Um, Julie's, uh, Julie's question is, I like your response, Kara, on there will never be just one cure. But when we start talking about research and challenges of AMCs, we can often get lost in the terminology and the rhetoric and lose the donors. How do you suggest we speak to them on their level without underestimating their intelligence? It's a great question. That is a great question. And, you know, it is definitely if you've seen one donor, you've seen one donor, right? We have to customize our messaging and it's often kind of starting. I'll actually give you, let's start with the terminology AMC. If we start with, do you know what an academic medical center is? Their response could quickly tell you just how educated they are on the system in and of itself. So then that helps you determine, do I need to really start with the basics or actually they're a little bit further along? I would also say one of the things that I tell all gift officers, you will never know as much about your donor when it comes to a grateful patient. You'll never know much, as much about their disease or their health as they do. So you can't compete. We're not trying to be doctors. We're not trying to be researchers. So don't overdo it on that terminology because when you're starting to go toe to toe, you'll lose. And, and it's really important for us to keep that in mind and be humble about that. But it's also, we are the ones that are connecting the dots. That is our sole job. We are connecting the dots between the donor's passion, the donor's interest, and then our own funding priorities. So the more you're able to listen, you can sprinkle in the terminology and really it's going to be listening to what they may already know or what may be completely fresh to them. Skip some steps. You have to be nimble. If they already know quite a bit, skip some steps. That's okay. It's really customizing it and asking the right questions versus telling them something. Because if you ask the right questions, you'll realize what needs to be told versus not. That's great. And, you know, taking it to the next level. So, oh, actually, if you don't mind going back, Kara, I don't think I had a chance to. Yeah. So we're going to talk a little bit. We talked about the broad communications and how do you infuse the, um, the, the power of an academic medical center across your communications? And obviously, you know, as we've been talking about, sometimes it's very clear and the AMC is used and sometimes it's just talked about um, in terms of the three areas of strength. Um, I also wanted to talk about, I think there's some amazing ways that being an AMC can be used as part of your cultivation strategy. As you're getting to know your donors and um, you know this actually goes to Julie's question as well offering them a chance to maybe take a peek and see for themselves what it means to be a part of an academic medical center giving them a chance to have a tour of research labs or sitting down with students and hearing about their experience um, giving them a chance to visit and and participate in a, in a grand rounds or a lecture um, or even sitting down with a um, a clinician who can talk about caring for patients or the research that they do or training residents. Um, I, I think there's some really powerful ways that you can use being an AMC to, to your real advantage as a, as a fundraiser. And I'm curious if you have any ideas of how you've done this where you are. I know uh, often a lot of places use the word uh, or use the term uh, medical school for an evening or mini medical school, you know, where you bring a bunch of people in and you show them. I mean, if you use that sort of thing or if you've had a twist on that that's been really successful, we'd love to hear it because there's some really powerful opportunities associated with it. And that actually continues when we talk about the power of AMCs and solicitations. You know, I think Kara was talking about listening to the donor motivations. What are they interested in? Um, what are the things that really um, they want to change in the world and, and do that through a gift to your academic medical center? Um, the power of an academic medical center is that there's there's such a breadth of things that they can do um, because it's research, patient care, and education. And so um, you should leverage that as part of your solicitations um, and, and really use that as a way to better connect with your donors and, and really close that gift. And one of the things I wanted to mention too, I don't know if we have anyone here from a community hospital who is a part of an academic medical center and system. Uh, you know, this is this is something that um, I've done a lot of work in and I just wanted to touch on this because as we know, um, 
systems are now how things are in healthcare. And in my experience, your donors may be really skeptical of the connection to an academic medical center, or they might be elated. Um, for many, in many situations, we know that um, uh, those academic medical centers in partnership with those community hospitals often help give them greater financial stability. Sometimes they're able to provide access to clinical trials or other research that's going on. Occasionally, you'll see residency programs that are to be able to set up at these um, uh, you know, community hospitals that are associated with the system. So if you're in one of those situations, or if you have colleagues who are, there's a lot of ways that you can use the AMC message as a positive in your conversation, even with donors at a local community level. Okay, as we start winding up here, I want to give some really great examples that just a quick online search and you really start seeing the breadth of ways that different organizations are able to highlight their status as an AMC. And here you see some of our UC Davis. I believe we have a UC Davis uh, employee on the line. So thank you for joining us and well done. Uh, we also have the Cleveland Clinic, and they are a fantastic example of such a nationally renowned institution that, again, as soon as you go to their website and it's who we are, it's at the core of who they are. You notice they even start here. This is with mission, vision, all of those basics that we know we can come to expect when we go to any hospital's website. It's right there, front and center. And then we also have USF Health. So I'm actually, I live in the Tampa area. So this is in my backyard. And I loved their example because again, you see another video, both USF Health and Cleveland Clinic utilized videos just like Penn. And it's such an easy and interesting way to describe the nature of your organization that we really, if you can, we really encourage you to utilize that medium just because it's something that you can also easily send to donors. And again, that engagement is such a key part because they often think they know what we are. And so being able to, in a creative way, get something in front of them without them necessarily asking is also another um, little tip there. Because again, if you ask somebody, do you know what an academic medical center is? They often go, yes, of course. No, they don't. Okay, as we wind down here, uh, we're really interested in your questions. We can give you more, more examples. We can talk more um, about some different things that we've seen uh, as consultants with our clients. And again, um, some of which are on the line. So yes, if you're on the line and you work with me, I might be calling on you, but we really do want to hear from you. We had that great question uh, in the chat, and we'd like to hear some more because the more that you're able to inquire with us and we give you our tips, we also have a, a, another group of people on the line as well that might be able to answer them just as well as we can. That's right. And, you know, Kara, we had Lisa from New Mexico jump in with a really great comment here in chat, and I'll let everybody check that out. But I really like, Lisa, how you're mentioning um, how clinically integrating care across a system can really um, be such a benefit for the patients in the communities, um, bringing clinical, you know, you know, sort of the phrase, you know, bring care close to home. You want to be able to be close to uh, your home when you're getting a clinical trial or trying a new drug or something like that. And so it's um, it's great to hear how you're using that. And um, I'm really uh, excited to to hear how you're using that in your in your whole system wide thinking. And they're using that in Chicago at Northwestern Medicine. Nice. That's great. Well, one of the things I'm actually going to ask um, a, a question here. Um, one of the things that Elizabeth had talked about that I'll tell you, I actually learned during this process. Um, she talked about how many burn units are at academic medical centers. And I'll tell you, as someone who, thank God, knock on wood, has never had to even visit anyone in a burn unit, I really thought that that was something that most hospitals had and did not realize that that was a differentiating factor. 
I'm interested if any of you who are on the line work at a hospital that has a specific burn unit. And if you have ever utilized that in your communications with donors, because again, as somebody who has been in the field for nearly 20 years, when you put that in perspective, because I know many people are like myself, they've never had to visit somebody, never want to visit. But to know that that's such a unique factor, I think it's one, whether you work in cancer, pediatrics, diabetes, to know that your hospital has such a unique com a component of care that we never want to take advantage of, but at a scary time is there, no matter what area of the hospital you work in, I think you can weave that into your message. And I'm just interested to know, does anybody work at a hospital that has a burn unit? And have you ever really highlighted just how rarefied that air is? That's great. Well, we'll give folks a couple minutes to jump in on chat and answer that question or, or pose their own. Um, in the meantime, how about I share some resources and sort of see, um, just want to make sure uh, that you're all aware of some of the really great things that are out there, some of the resources that we used in developing this presentation, and some things that can help you as you think about how you talk about being an AMC with your populations. I really do suggest check out what Double AMC has. What starts here is kind of their microsite around the power of academic medical centers. They have some great things there. Um, I, I really, I pointed out earlier the podcast, um, the fourth bullet down is the impact of academic medical centers on local communities and beyond. This is another area, um, you know, talking about the economic impact of AMCs. So these are some resources that you can use or share with your colleagues uh, to tap in and, and you know, use so that you can talk and you can be empowered to talk about the power of AMCs. Um, we're here, I'm seeing some responses here, um, Kara, around the burn unit. Yeah, um, you have UC Davis Health has used it as well as Virginia Commonwealth. And I really like, so one, the uh, UCDH, they have used it in annual giving, um, which is a great place because Again, you really have to grab the reader and what a great place to do that and talk about something that people really aren't all that familiar with, which really is a hook, right? And then interestingly enough, again, I work with Virginia Commonwealth and did not know that they had the oldest civilian burn facility in the US. Wow. That's, that's, that's cool. That's cool, right? Um, and then we also, oh, Sydney also said that they use it for their patient calling program. Another great example where you really do have to kind of get them up with a hook, um, something that piques their interest. Oh, and then we also have Julie who has said, um, oh, wow, that's a great, unfortunate example, but an actual um, personal example where a friend of hers needed the burn unit. And again, um, I think we all think of the various um, parts of a hospital that we don't want to visit, but we know could happen. A burn unit isn't one of those places. It's really something we don't think about. And then to know that when you need it, you need it extremely quickly. And it sets the course for your treatment and your recovery that to know that one is in your own backyard, again, it's just a really good way to highlight one unique factor. Imagine how many other, just as this says, I think there are a lot of best kept secrets about AMCs. Mm -hmm. and, and a burn unit is only one example. Um, actually, one that we also listed was inpatient beds for alcoholism. Again, something we don't think about, but alcoholic inpatient care is very rare. Most of it is done outpatient. So to know that the majority of inpatient alcohol beds are within these academic medical centers, the unique nature, that's, I keep using the same word, unique, unique, unique. That's what's important because they are that exactly those best kept secrets and the level one traumas. Again, these are services we don't want to utilize but when you need them to know that they're there and your donors are able to advance those initiatives through their support, 
even if it's not that they're interested in an alcohol bed, a burn unit, a trauma one, that's how you talk to them and you inspire them by saying, you may not need it, but your neighbor may. And to know that you're able to help make that happen, I mean, we all want to be a part of that, right? These are great. Thank you so much for um, some really good examples here at the end. Um, I know Elizabeth and I were thrilled to be here on a topic that, frankly, when BWF said, hey, we really want you to do a, a webinar for the healthcare sector, Elizabeth and I put our heads together and, and we really said, this is something that is really important that on one hand gets talked about every day. And on the other hand, is that hidden gem? Let's bring this to light. And we really hope that everyone has found it beneficial for just a reminder. It's really what this is, the reminder that you work at a special place and we all have pride in our institution. But when we draw ourselves up to the macro and micro levels, we can say we work for a very small subset of our healthcare units. Mm -hmm. Our philanthropists are an even smaller subset of those philanthropists. We need to be loud and proud, and we really need to put some education out there so that we can all be on the same page and really wave that same flag. With that, we would love to hear from you. We would like to be sure that you give us your feedback. Um, it's important for Elizabeth and I, mm -hmm. as we said, we are specialists in healthcare. Well, we are talking to healthcare philanthropy today, and we want to be sure that we are giving you content that you find useful, applicable, and the only way for us to know what kind of content you'd like to see in the future is mm -hmm. to hear your feedback. So please do take a moment. You can uh, screenshot this QR code, and there's just a few questions. We just want to hear from you so that we can continue to deliver really great, informative webinars. That's great. Thank you, everyone, for spending some time with us today and having a conversation on this important topic. We look forward to your feedback. Please do contact us. Our contact information is here for you, and we mean it. We want to hear from you, and um, happy to email, text, call. Um, please do take down our contact information because we want to just continue the dialogue, um, especially as you come up with maybe some solicitations and go, wait, how do I really leverage this? Um, we would love to give you our insights and really do welcome that continued dialogue. So thank you all very, very much. We've got about four minutes left, um, which I'm counting as a win because Elizabeth and I could talk about this all day. So the fact that we're getting you out <laughs> on time is a good thing. Thank you all very, very much. And Julie's asking for the resource links. And I believe that the slides will be sent separately. They'll be, um, they will be going out to those who registered. So Julie, look for those in your email. All right. Well, happy Wednesday. And now go forth and spread all the education you can about academic medical centers. Good luck, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.